ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Slip Safety Show. My name's Christian Harris and I'm the founder of Slip Safety Services as well as being the host of this show. Today's episode is a really valuable and fascinating one with a good friend of mine, Darren Holmes, from the uh, largest uh, insurance brokerage in the world called Marsh, and we confirm that uh, point in the conversation. Darren heads up operational risk, uh, and so he's got a wealth of knowledge and insight when it comes to uh, particularly larger businesses, but also gets involved in SMEs uh, and what they're doing to manage their risks on a day-to-day -day basis. We talk about, as you'd expect, the uh, coronavirus pandemic and what effect that's been having, but also we get into uh, how the insurance market has been changing over the last few years with premiums going up as the market hardens, uh, what that means for companies and how risk managers should be approaching the uh, risks and opportunities uh, that that presents, and lots of other uh, topics as well around data and insights. Um, fundamentally, what Darren focuses on is the fact that risk management is all about driving the bottom line. And we start on that point and we finish on that point. Um, and so, you know, bear that in mind as you're watching. And I think you'll get a lot from this one. Um, if you do find it useful, um, it would be great if you could recommend watching to uh, any friends or colleagues. And please do give us a subscribe as well. Um, that's always helpful for us because uh, it helps us to show uh, the, uh, the YouTube and the podcast world that um, the content is uh, valuable and it's helpful for you because you'll be reminded as and when new episodes uh, are released. So with that, let's get into it and we'll join my conversation with Darren Holmes from Marsh. Darren Holmes, welcome to the Slip Safety Show. Thanks, Christian. Glad to be here. It's uh, great to see you, um, albeit uh, not face to face like we would uh, would normally prefer to get together. But uh, we're all living in a world of Zoom nowadays. Absolutely, challenging times, but we're adapting well and adapting quickly as well. Yeah, that actually that agility. I've been really impressed with you know business as a whole and, and everybody's agility and, and moving quickly and I'm sure um, from a risk management perspective you've been very impressed with that as well. I have I think the some of the real highlights for me is the way that businesses have adapted to be able to continue to do where they can continue to work how they've been able to adapt so quickly to be able to try and keep as business as usual as they can. Mm. Um, I think there's been some challenges around along the way, and I think some industries have struggled more than others. But overall, I think people have done an amazing job um, working really, really quickly. And I think that's testament to both their commitment and, and the people that work for them. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so just for the, for the benefit of, of those uh, watching or listening in, do you want to just give us a quick um, overview of who you are and a bit of your background and how you've become, uh, what you've become and where you are? Sure. So um, I started my career in insurance broking over 20 years ago. Um, originally started my career at uh, a nuclear power station down at Sizewell on the uh, East Coast. Um, I then worked operationally in risk management for a number of years before I was approached by uh, another broker, Willis Towers Watson. Um, I went to work for them and was with them for 17 years uh, before being approached by Marsh. Yep. And at that time, I think that it was a changing world. I think the industry, the, the, the risk industry, was very much seen as either operational risk or it was seen as transactional risk mm -hmm. um, but over the last particularly over the last I would say probably five to ten years there's been a huge step change into uh, to looking at risk in a much more holistic view and looking at how what organizations do impact their bottom line and how that how that affects their their PL accounts yeah 
yeah no absolutely um and there's been an even greater uh, change in the last three months as well so <laughs> I'm sure. absolutely absolutely and i think that you know go, just going back to that point that we were talking about earlier about organizations and their, their their ability to be agile and adapt to that change really really quickly i think we're still seeing that now you know i think we're we've seen the the original crisis as it hit and organizations adapt really quickly to try and continue to do their business as usual. Yeah. I think what we've seen over the last, um, probably last four or five weeks, is how do we now maintain that and how do we prepare to get back to as normal as we possibly can? And what can we learn from, you know, from, from the last 12 weeks as well? And how can we apply that learning to our business moving forward? Mm. Um, and you know, I think the world's gonna be a different place. I think the world's certainly gonna be a different place from, from a risk perspective. Mm. Um, it's interesting when you look at, you know the pandemic how many people ever thought that that would come down the line how many how many organizations ever thought that a pandemic was going to be the thing that really challenged them um mm. in this decade yeah it's it's crazy isn't it if you think about what, what's happened and mm. the fact that we just could yeah i'm, I'm sure some people uh, did see it coming but i don't think anybody really realistically thought it would it would happen to this uh, to this extent I think you're absolutely right, and I think it raises a whole question around risk perception, and the and the the difference in organisations and and how they perceive risk. And it takes large events and catastrophes to some extent like this um, for us to realise the impact that these events have not just on our business but on industry as a whole, but also wider across society. I think that no one could ever foresee the impact that you know that an event like this would have overall on society in the way that we we as a as a, as a glo across the globe have to adapt and change um yeah it's uh, challenging but it keeps you keeps you nice and busy and engaged and solving interesting problems so uh, there's there's always a plus side i think one of the things that's interesting is that we going back to what you were saying about you know learning and 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 adapting um, of course um, you know we none of us want to be in the position that we have become into that that we're kind of the worst uh, case in in Europe as to how this has affected us but that does mean that you know we do get the benefit of seeing what other countries are doing that have kind of got a bit further down the line and opening things up and we can learn from that so you know perhaps we can make fewer mistakes in in phases two three and four as we get down the line I think, I think you're absolutely right. I do think we have a little bit more insight than some of the other countries, you know, whichever way you look at it is, you know, all the tragic lives lost because of this. Um, it's horrific. But I think if we can take some of the learning, and I think there's a lot to be said about that. Um, you know, if you look across risk in a wider context, irrespective of the, you know, of the pandemic, but if we look at risk from, um, from all of the different events that have happened around the world, if we could just spend a little bit more time in learning the lessons that came out of those and apply that learning to our business, we can actually make our business more resilient. And I don't think it matters in which context that you look at that risk, whether we're looking at a large environmental disaster all the way through to, you know, you know, to, to, to somebody slipping over, um, you know, it, all of those risks hurt a business's bottom line mm -hmm. at some point. Um, and I think that the, the thing that this pandemic has really taught, I think, us as a society, certainly, certainly from an industry perspective, um, is that if we could just listen and learn and just review and understand a little bit more about what has occurred and what's happened, um, you know, I, I, I just think that we can move forward in, in a much more insightful place. I do think one of the uh, one of the plus sides to this um, is that you know the the risk professionals role has been made more prominent and I do think that you know companies are going to be taking this more seriously and uh, investing more and therefore there is a greater chance that what you've talked about in terms of learning lessons and implementing solutions will take hold more more extensively than it has done in the past. I, th I think you're absolutely right I think that you know th these the these large you know catastrophic events whether they happen to us or whether they happen to other organizations across the globe they give us an opportunity to reflect but i agree completely that it will change the role of the risk manager moving forward 
I think that there's other aspects that we perhaps are yet to um, yet to be realised, um, and I think those are the the wider implications of this pandemic on um, on the insurance market, for example, and how the insurance market have also had to adapt to this scenario. I think that there's uh, currently there's a lot of talk around you know the the, the pandemic couldn't have come along. A, at probably a worse time for the, for the insurance risk market. Mm. Um, the markets were already going through an incredibly difficult time. Um, it was a transition, been a transitioning market for over a year. And I think we have, you know, we've seen rates, particularly in certain classes of insurance, really start to shoot up. Yeah. Um, and I think it's over the last, this is the, this is the tenth consecutive uh, rate increase that we've seen. Um, and so as we sort of try to navigate our way through this 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 pandemic and COVID-19 scenario um I think what you know what's the implications of that on on the insurance market and what does that mean to me as a risk manager for my business how will that impact me and I think that's the bit that will now will now start to see about you know uh, um sort of transpire out of this yeah because I mean the insurers obviously haven't in lots of lines haven't been making any profits and therefore um, starting putting to re putting rates up historically, but I mean going forward, I guess there's going to be a lot of um, aspects of business, particularly thinking about safety and and hygiene and PPE and and things like that. That um, insurers are going to be pretty uh, reluctant to be covering. So that's going to raise some interesting challenges in terms of what do what do clients do? What do you do as a risk manager to to navigate that if you can't get insurance or or actually could get insurance, but the premium is just so astronomical that it's um, not justifiable. Mm. I, 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 think, I think you're absolutely right. I think if we look back at where the market was changing and what drove those market changes, you know, the wildfires in Australia, for example, um, last year had a, a huge detrimental effect on the insurance market. Something that, you know, you know if, if you look at the global risk, um, if you look at the global risks sort of uh, insights that that come from from a lot of um, uh, analytical work, um, we know that sort of climate change, environmental biodiversity, we know those things sit right at the top of those global risk on that global sort of risk register. Mm. But I think that if we look back over the last five years and the implication of those, you know, the the floods, the hurricanes, etc they culminate in, in a constant drain on the insurance market, a constant drain that just cannot be capital controlled. But what that does is you then start to see that feed through into other types of classes of insurance, you know, away from that cat and away from property, um, et cetera, away from sort of financial lines. And you start to see that filter down into things that, that tend to hit home more, you know, more closer, you know, motor, casualty, you know, employer's liability, et cetera. Um, and I th and I think that what it does is it it, it requires organisations to take a much broader view of the way that they look at risk, not just from a control perspective, but as a total cost of risk perspective as well, and start to understand what is it that that organisation does, what is unique to that industry that's actually driving the claims onto my book, um, and what message does that send to the insurance market, and how do I you know how do i give confidence to those insurance markets that i have this under control and i think that's where we're starting to see a real shift in the way that risk managers look at the way that they control both transactional risk and non-transactional risk so insured risk and, and non-insured risk mm. i read a quote from somebody um i can't think who it was now but it said that um you're not buying insurance you're selling risk which i think is kind of what you're saying you know your your role is to position uh, as a risk manager position your your company in the best possible light so you can actually get the right terms so you're looking as you're selling yeah. the opportunity rather than it's a transaction coming the other way where they've got something you need and you you're just kind of buying it uh, you're absolutely right christian uh, i think that i think that it's been understood probably i would say you know 
last sort of five to seven years, I think businesses have been much more aware of the importance of being able to sell their risk to insurance carriers. But I think that you know, something like, you know, particularly in a transitioning market that we've seen over the last sort of like 12, 18 months, I think what we're seeing now is how will COVID-19 impact us moving forward? What impact will that have on the insurance market? And what can I do as, an impl as, as a client to position myself as a risk of choice? Because ultimately that's what you want to do. You're competing in actually quite a, a, quite a, a competitive area. You know, there's, there's only so many markets that you can place your risk into. Um, which ones are going to offer me the best terms? And how do I leverage what I'm currently doing and use that in the best possible way to sell my story, to give that insurer confidence that the premium that I'm paying them is going to be protected because I've got good operational risk controls in place. That's really where I think the, the focus needs to be moving forward. Yeah, yeah. So on that then, I mean, <clears throat> obviously we've spoken a fair bit about COVID and that's going to have an ongoing impact on all sorts of aspects of, of people's um, <clears throat> business and, and their risk profile. But if we kind of try to forget that <clears throat> uh, for the moment, mm. where, where do you see the, the top few areas that people perhaps struggle with or, or where there's room for improvement, you know, because you get to see, see a wide range of businesses and all sorts of sectors. Are there any kind of commonalities um, you know, where, where there are things people could maybe do a bit better? So I think that there has been a, I think there's been a shift over the last, uh, last five years to where there's been a real heavy industry. I don't mean heavy industry. I mean, a, a real focus on industry. Uh, with a with a lens and that whilst that's been carried forward with uh with broken houses and insurance broken um companies for, for for a number of years i think we're now really starting to see insurers grasp that that industry lens and start to ask questions about what is it particular about that industry um that i can foresee losses coming out of Hmm. So I think that that industry lens is, is one part of it. But I think the other part of it um, is, is really to do with that, come, come back to that transitioning market piece. Irrespective of COVID, the market was transitioning hmm. you know, 12, 18 months, 12 months ago, and it continues to do so. So I think that a big focus for, uh, for, um, for clients at the moment needs to be around that defensibility piece, around that claims defensibility, and the ability to be able to evidence. You know, I think that, you know, I, I, I know that a lot of people sort of say, um, you know, all accidents are preventable. And I think to some extent that that's true, where you have control over some of the events that actually occur, particularly around, for example, employ, you know, employee employees yeah. um, where you can actually control the activities and the, and the work that they do where I think it becomes really really difficult is where you've got members of the public coming in yeah. and you yeah. don't have the ability to intervene so much or have that level of control over over members of the public and so those members of the public in you know interact in a completely different way that your employees interact so providing you know having good controls in place to be able to provide that level of defensibility I think is absolutely vital moving forward without question. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a, that's a re really big, um, a really big piece. I think that there's also just going back to my point around industry lenses. I think it's important that, 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 companies look at the industry they're in and understand what's actually driving cost on their bottom line. Um, and I'm talking about costs for, for claims, et cetera. What's actually driving those? What's unique? You know, if it's, you know, if, you, you, if you're in a sort of a um, sort of a casual dining sector, for, for example, is it, you know, slips, trips and falls? Is it burns, you know, in the kitchen? Is it cuts? Um, which might seem like small things, but I was having a really interesting conversation with somebody over at a large insurer um, just just before Christmas, mm. and it was uh, their their point was really well made to me. As a global insurer, their concern is not to do with individual companies, but rather the industries that those companies work within. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at the attritional losses across those industries that are driving insurance losses, mm -hmm. that's their focus. So this particular insurance company was, I'm not so much bothered about what individual businesses do, 
what I'm bothered about is the attritional losses for slips, trips and falls, yeah. the attritional losses for manual handling, the attritional losses for noise induced hearing loss. They're, that's where their concern is, because when mm. you multiply that globally, it starts to become a massive, a, a massive cost to, yeah. to those companies. Mm. And that is the challenge with, uh, with, with slips that, that, that I see and, and with manual handling and with these other attritional uh, losses, because it's very easy if you're um, a business owner uh, with, you know, 10 or 20 sites to see, well, we get two or three claims a year per site. And actually that's, that's, you know, that's fine. We're covered and blah, blah, blah. But um, it, it's when, you know, these numbers from the insurer perspective start to really, really multiply and add up. And I mean, something like AXA, for example, they published um, an article a couple of years ago and they said that they spend just in the UK uh, 80 million a year on slips. Uh, so not, not trips and falls, just slips. And I think 50 million on manual handling. Um, you know, so individual clients, as you say, well, that's it's 10 grand here and 10 grand there. But mm. when you start adding it all together, it becomes a hell of a lot of money. You're absolutely right, Christian. I think you raise a really good point around that. Is and and that's about being able to dig down through the data and really start to focus on what is actually driving those costs for your business. Are they, you know, all insurers, um, not all, but most most insurers will categorise slips, trips, and falls as one category, yeah. the same as they might, they may categorize a, you know, musculoskeletal, but that could mean, that means many different things for many different people. But when you actually start to dig down even further, is it slips, is it trips or is it falls? Yeah. If you then put an industry lens over the top of that, it really starts to help you understand where you can focus. And I absolutely agree with you. It's, you know, one or two slips, you know, um, a, a month even, over a period of year doesn't look like a huge amount you know across you know if you're an organization that employs you know 20,000 people mm. that doesn't look like a lot at all no. when you apply that globally yeah that makes a massive difference yeah. and it is exactly that conversation that ensure that it's that picture that the insurer sees they don't just see it within the UK they actually see it globally across a book of casualty, workers' comp, property, et cetera. That's the bit that they're actually looking at. That's the bit that actually makes a difference and is driving the decisions that they make within their business. Mm. The other way that I've um, started trying to get this across uh, is, is around, and it, and it works in exactly the same way for other attritional uh, losses, is actually saying, well, look, you might only have one or two a month, um, but actually let's just think about this from the perspective of how many uh, buildings are there in the UK and how many people are admitted to hospital every year? You know, so they had a serious enough accident of whatever type that they go to hospital every year. And in the case of slips, you know, it's about 300,000 a year that go to hospital. And in terms of buildings, there are millions of buildings in, in the country. So if you said, well, divide the number of seri serious enough accidents to go to hospital by the number of buildings, you get a, a number that's much, much less than one per year. And therefore, if you, if you think about that, OK, well, I'm having one or two a month. I'm way above average and therefore, you know, I need to do something about this um, a bit more. And mm. perhaps my, perhaps my, um, my belief that one or two a month wasn't that bad is, is actually wrong. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think the, I think it comes back to the point we were talking about earlier about lessons learned. I think too often we focus on, I think, and I think there's something right, right in about, what I'm going to say, and I can understand why companies do this, is that they, they use data to decide where to invest time and effort to drive down cost. Um, you know, so I've, you know, as a company in the last month, I've had five musculoskeletal um, claims and I've had one slip. I'm going to focus my resources, my time, my money, my people on addressing those musculoskeletal. The, the, and I absolutely understand that. That's about making data-driven decisions about how you manage risk. I, I absolutely get that. But I think that the, there is a danger in that those more um, sort of infrequent incidents, which attritionally add up across a larger period, are actually what is driving the cost of your risk. So there is a danger that you lose sight of some of the, the smaller issues. Um, I think the, I think it's also about looking at you know if if you're using data to 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 make decisions then you know link into other industry groups you know your point around buildings if you could categorise those buildings to certain types of building 
you know, are, there, are they residential buildings where they have common areas and are the incidents occurring? Well, I think we're, I think as a, in the UK, we're very fortunate. We have access to a huge amount of data that's available to us. To, to us. I think what we need to be best, if I was a client, if I was working operationally uh, in a, in a, in, for a business, um, for an organisation, I would be looking at all of my data sources that I could possibly tap into to try and build a picture about what it looks like. Not just what it looks like for me, but you know, what does it look like for me? Now apply that across industry, apply it across region, apply it across um, segments, the size of business that you are, but then start to think about sort of applying it, you know, globally. What does that actually look like? Because if we look at the cost of slip, slip strips and falls, for example, if you just say slips, if you look at the cost of slips um, attritionally across the globe, you know, for, for insurers, that's what's driving their book. That's what's driving that that bottom figure so I think there is a way that you can start and you can do that quite quickly I think there's I think it's finding a balance between your investment in time with using data to make informed decisions but actually then or do I apply that the time that I would spend on that on actually addressing this this, this matter as, as a resource because we're still a limited resource I think there's also a lot to be said around piloting work and I don't think that we do enough sort of piloting in the right way to really understand what is actually working for my business and what's not working for my business. So where organizations implement a number of, of, of interventions to address slips, trips, falls, uh, musculoskeletal disorders, whatever they are, but where these organizations are, are putting those interventions in is actually monitoring which ones are working and which ones are not yeah. and using data points that actually demonstrate that, that it's having a positive effect. So not just using accident data but also using sort of leading indicators like audit data to really understand you know i know we've had a conversation before around sort of slip resistance testing and i appreciate that you know there's, there's a number of sort of like views around the the, the sort of the purpose of, of slip resistance testing and and does it actually you know does, does it actually hold any weight in court probably not so much in court, but actually, you know, using slip resistance testing as a leading indicator and then tying that back to the number of slips that occur within your business is a fantastic way, for example, to be able to use, you know, to, to, to drive down slips using leading indicators. That, that, I think that's a really great way of doing it. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been uh, doing a lot of work, as, as you know, in, in, in um, sort of helping companies to get Fit, fit and ready for reopening mm. after the lockdown and I've been talking a lot about um, you need these leading indicators not necessarily around slips because that's not such a big uh, worry for people right now but obviously everybody's paranoid about being hygienic and you can't be mm. hygienic without being clean you know it's impossible mm. to disinfect without being clean so how do you measure cleanliness and there's mm. qualitative ways subjective ways and then there's quantitative ways uh, like measuring hygiene levels with ATP tests and various other things. So getting people to think about that, and it's not just uh, we need to be clean, let's throw an army of cleaners at it. It's actually we need to be clean, let's verify that and prove, as you said earlier, that the way the method we're using is actually working. So we're not wasting time by kind of doing stuff that isn't actually effective. I think we're on. The, I, I agree with you, Christian. I think we're on the precipice of a uh, of a fantastic opportunity. I think as we come out of lockdown and we move forward, and whether the focus is on, um, you know, social distancing, whether it's on cleanliness, whether it's on, you know, picking up debris from the floor because that's what people keep slipping on. Yeah. The fact is that you know this will lead a fund. I think this will lead to a fundamental shift in behaviour. We've already seen the shift in behavior around social distancing. Yeah. You, know, you only need to walk into a supermarket now or somewhere that can be open to see how people are acting. You know, people won't sort of like come anywhere close to you, you know, mm -hmm. and, and people might make a joke of it, but we have actually changed the behavior of mm -hmm. an entire society in a very, very short period of time. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is an opportunity for us to learn, for, again, learn from this and, and think about, you know, what does that actually mean as we come out of lockdown and we move forward? You know, that, that, that behavior to 
maintain social distancing, will that we then see a behaviour to maintain a level of cleanliness, which doesn't really go away? And is this an opportunity to create that fundamental shift that we need to encourage, you know, encourage a, a, a different way of doing things? I don't know. Yeah, and I mean, uh, I'm quite, I'm hope, hoping that, you know, things like the environment as well, you know, we've seen um, just by chance, I suppose, the, the fact that we've had fewer planes and cars and so on, that the, there's all these environmental indicators improving. So I'm kind of hoping that we can, again, take a step back and learn and say, well, actually, you know, what can we do to try and maintain this and not just go back to, to the way we were? Because I'm sure the, the planet, uh, or, or, you know, the residents of the planet aren't very happy about everything, but the planet itself mm. would, be, uh, would be very happy about what's been going on, I'm sure. I, 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 I think that's absolutely right. I think we are, I think we will always, that will always be challenged because mm. I think as businesses try to recover, it's just, it's sort of like a, it's, it's sort of like a never ending circle, really. You know, we need businesses to get back up to full speed to be able to, you know, to, to generate the, the revenue, to employ the people. Yeah to you know have the, the 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 people coming in to you know to produce the the revenue to keep our places safe and and healthy so we can invest in that in the future but the speed in which we do that needs to be done you know businesses need to recover they you know there's been so much you know it's for some organizations i think this has been a real this has been a really really difficult time and i mm. i i can only talk from what i've seen locally within within the uk um and not broader across the world but i think you know organizations have shown an absolute phenomenal level of spirit in being in protecting their employees mm. um and i know that there's been a lot of criticism of, of some um of some people you know furloughing staff but this is about businesses trying to you know to protect themselves as much as they possibly can there's always going to be those odd ones you know there's always going to be odd things on the side that we don't have the full picture we don't know the history behind it it's yeah. wrong to to judge every organization or or any organization really unless we know the full picture that sits behind it so i think we have to be careful as a society that we don't do that um that we, that you know we that we respect that everyone's had their own difficult time but what i do think that we will what we will have at the end of this is um organizations that are um are, are trying to get back to as business as usual as they possibly can but actually also reflecting and having the time to do that safely because we can't just all rush back. We can't just rush back, you know, there will still be, you know, two meter distancing rules, which is going to, you know, if you take a shopping center, for example, still gonna to have to restrict the numbers of people going into that shopping center to be able to maintain those levels of social distancing. And whilst there'll be a lot of focus and attention on, on managing that two meter rule, moving forwards and monitoring that two meter rule. I think there'll also be time to look broader at those other risks that perhaps sit on our, our on the book of claims um, and or on our accident history um, and think about, well, how can we use this time now to, to make this work in our phases for the future? And I think it's those organizations that will position themselves better with the insurance markets in the future. Yeah. Um, because they'll be able to evidence that they have their risk under control and that they're doing everything they possibly can to A, prevent the accident from happening that could lead to the claim, and B, if it does, if they do have an accident that, and it does lead to a claim that they're positioned well enough to be able to provide that defen defensibility, hence coming back to that point around sort of uh, leading and lagging indicators. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. So, so Darren, if people are uh, picking up what you're putting down, which I'm sure they are, if they've managed to... Uh, stay with us for this time um tell us a bit about what um what you can do an mrc can do to help um, and how that kind of works so i think that um so mrc march risk consulting um we we're, we're a fundamental part of the insurance relationship um so we work between the broking side of our business which is placing the insurance into the market the client to helping them manage risk. And we're all about helping use data to identify where the issues are and then providing solutions and support 
to help navigate those solutions to make them work for that business and ensure that they are feeding that information, making sure that we feed that information back into the insurers to give that, that business the, the right risk profile moving forward so we can leverage better premium reduction, um, premium management, um, support from the insurers and in helping manage those, those risks. So as a, as a, as a team, we're, we're split out into uh, property. Um, probably the best way to think about it is property, casualty, motor. So we work across lo those areas. Um, and what we do is we provide those uh, bespoke tailored solutions for our clients to help manage risk based on our knowledge globally yeah. of, of what other organizations are doing. So, so we are, but what I think is really important and what differentiates us from a consultancy is that we are part of the, the wider risk management sort of portfolio. So it's not just about managing sort of liabilities under the um, Health and Safety at Work Act, um, but it's also about looking at it through an insurance lens. So yeah. managing, the, managing the civil liability um, and then really f using that information and feeding that back to the insurer to promote the client as a risk of choice um, in the insurance market and overall manage down that cost of risk to allow more thoughtful and, um, and beneficial reinvestment in that business to you know to continuously improve over a period of time yeah yeah no, that makes sense and do you do you just work for um clients that marsh do does the insurance brokerage for or do you work for standalone uh, clients as well no we will work we'll work for any clients um we'll work for anyone that need our support and, right. and our help we don't just work for for uh, clients of marsh every 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 prospect every company out there um, will benefit from somebody's insight and somebody's knowledge what we're bringing to the table is marsh marsh's depth and breadth of experience and knowledge and making that available to to, to anybody that that would benefit from our support yeah because as, as you said a few times you know the data is, is and the insights from data is is huge and you know being being part of the the biggest uh well you're still the biggest i'm not sure after the after we are. The, you are okay there you go so being part of the biggest uh, brokerage in the world is obviously helpful because you've got a minefield of, of data there that you can really learn from and, and uh, develop ideas from i think you're absolutely right christian it's uh, you know it's it's uh, a, a, an ongoing humorous uh, area about, about being the biggest broker in the world but actually when you dig under the surface of that that's about having exactly what you said it's about having access to a huge amount of data and where marsh are really good is about using that data proactively in the right way to help clients make informed decisions about risk within their business and that's the bit that we are very very good at yeah. um, so it's rather than just doing it because it's a so nice to have it's doing it for the right reasons right. that have a direct impact overall on that business and helps improve their P&L at the, at, the, at the end of the day that's what we're there that's what we're there to do yeah well absolutely absolutely and you said that's one of the first things you said it's all about the bottom line and so you know that's uh we've 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 sort of squared the circle and gone back to the beginning again which is which is a good way of, of wrapping up um how uh what, what's the best way of people uh, kind of learning more or uh, getting in touch with you or um do you you know do you do blogs or sort of any plugs uh, reach make? out through linkedin uh so you can reach reach me on linkedin um you can come to come to me direct if you go to the marsh website you can track me down um uh, probably the best way is, is through linkedin or through yourself christian um yeah. you know we've had a, we, we've known each other for for many many years um so although you still um, go for lunch with me but that's a that's a <laughs> <laughs> that's another story you still owe me lunch but we're gonna to have to wait until they open up know, to yeah. actually get it no i reckon what we'll do I'll, I'll just i'll 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 send you an amazon uh an amazon package of some spam and i'll have a tin of lovely spam or something and uh and we can do that over zoom it's perfect excellent brilliant <laughs> oh dear well that's that's a that's a great way to finish um an inside joke that nobody else will get but um Thank you very much for your time, Darren. I know how busy you are, so I really do appreciate it. And I'm sure no, it's an absolute pleasure. Uh, I'm pleasure. sure everybody everybody has has really got some great insights and learning from that. So uh, so thank you on their behalf as well. And really, we we'll see you again uh, on the other side of lockdown, where we can go and have that lunch. Excellent. Thanks, Christian. Cheers. Cheers. Bye bye. <laughs>